So this section is called Igniting a Passion for Creative Solutions. And we're going to be talking about uh, innovation, inspiring innovation. We have four people with us today who have graciously uh, accepted the invitation to be experts on something. <laughs> we have Tom Field, who's the director of the Angler Agribusiness Entrepreneurship Program at UNL. We have Megan Elliott, who's the director of the Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media Arts. We have Todd Long, who's the Vice President of Marketing and Innovation at Kidwell. And we had G Gina Stavos, who's the owner and innkeeper of Whispering Pines Bed and Breakfast. So what, I've, uh, what we're going to do uh, during this session, we have about 40 minutes, is I'm going to just ask them to introduce themselves briefly, maybe tell a little story, share something uh, that they want to share on the topic of entrepreneurship, innovation, creativity, that sort of thing. Uh, then we'll do a little bit of a moderated q and I've, I've got a couple of questions that uh, I thought I would ask them. Then I'm actually going to weigh into the sea of people in this room. And I'm going to try to take a question uh, maybe from each quadrant or so of the room. So I'll be wandering around with a mic. So if you're interested in asking a question of the panel as a whole or any one of them as individuals, raise your hand. Clearly, I won't get to everyone. right? So. Probably if you're closest to me, you might get chosen. So with that, I'm going to ask Gina to start. And uh, we'll go from there. OK. Is my mic on? Everybody hear me? OK, wonderful. Um, so I have about an hour. Is that right? No. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit. I get asked the question about how did you get into this business all the time. And the story can actually be about 30 minutes, 45, if we're sitting at the breakfast table drinking coffee. But I'm going to give you guys just a little piece of it. Um, I worked in Austin, Texas in the technology industry. And I used to take any and every opportunity I had to have a party, invite people over, entertain. So one night, it was Harvest Moon. So I sent out via um, pager, I believe, at that time, via Motorola or email. And I said, hey, let's get together. And um, six hours later, I had about 30 people at my house. And it would just happen. And we had my technology friends. I was a, a runner and a, a sprint triathlete at the time. So I had my triathlete friends joining me. I had my church friends. I had my neighbors. I had just people from all different walks of my life. And we had a big spread on the table of food. And we were just all having a really good time. And one of these uh, business owners from the bike shop in town says, you need to figure out how to do this for a living. And I said, what am I doing? And he says, look at this, you brought all these people together and you're just kind of the glue and these people wouldn't know each other if you hadn't sent that message out and said, let's get together and, and celebrate the harvest moon. So that's just a snippet of how I got into the business that I, that I am in. I've owned Whispering Pines Bed and Breakfast in Nebraska City for just over 12 years now. And I just have a lot of fun. Um, maybe some of you have been there. And if you haven't, I highly encourage you to come visit. Uh, hi, I'm Todd. Uh, I work for Kidwell. For those of you that don't know what Kidwell is, we are best known as an electrical contractor. We've done that for approximately 70 years. What people don't know about Kidwell is that over the last 20 years, we have either organically developed or acquired six different companies. And then within the last five, we started an innovation group, which focuses mostly on software development. And then in the last 12 months, we started a blue-collar business incubator called Blueprint. And we opened that up to the public about 60 days ago. We're currently interviewing four to five candidates for entry into the program. And uh, we're encouraged so far by, by what we're seeing from it. Hi. My name's Megan Elliott, and as you've heard, I'm the founding director of the Johnny Carson Centre for Emerging Media Arts. I'm originally from Australia, but via about 19 other countries to land up in Lincoln, Nebraska. The, um, the Johnny Carson Centre for Emerging Media Arts, for those of you who don't know, has been made possible by a really generous gift of $20 million from the Johnny Carson Foundation. And we're building a brand new undergraduate program, a brand new graduate program, a brand new research program, and it's terribly exciting. We're going to be based in the old Nebraska bookstore. I've, tomorrow, no, Friday, my curriculum, or our curriculum for our new Bachelor of Fine Arts in Emerging Media Arts is going towards the entire 
faculty of the Hicks and Leeds Fine and Arts Performing College. So it's on its way up the tree to go to meet the Board of Regents and um, then the state of Nebraska. And our curriculum is based on, because we're speaking about creativity and innovation, is based on the idea that there is a new trivium. So, and we're in a liberal arts and uh, college um, or university, and that new trivium is technological agility or, or technological literacy, data literacy, and human literacy. And to, to be able to achieve or to work within that rubric of that new trivium, you need four new cognitive capacities if you are going to be robot proof for the 21st century. And I'm mapping these four new co um, cognitive capabilities against four areas of expertise that I want, I want to graduate uh, professionals to have. And that is cultural agility, which we map to storytelling, critical thinking, which we map to design, entrepreneurship, which we map to entrepreneurship, and systems thinking, which we heard about this morning, which we map to computational media. So we're really excited about this curriculum. We're, we're, it's totally interdisciplinary. I'm working, I'm in bed with the engineers, I'm in bed with the computer scientists. It's a, it's a lot of fun and I'm really excited to be working with everyone and to be here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Prior to accepting this role, what I'm most known for internationally is starting my own company. Um, uh, in 2004 with uh, my now husband, that's another story. Um, and uh, Cross Media Lab we took was a digital media entrepreneurship program and bootstrapping on our own with no institutional support, we took that to 14 countries and 22 cities around the world. And out of those 14 countries, only five of them had English as the first language. And so that was really exciting and I'm very excited to be here to be able to bring that extraordinary international network to Lincoln, Nebraska and to the Johnny Carson Centre for Emerging Media Arts. And also, I'm so honoured to be on this stage because in my industry, which is the media industry, no way would you have seen four rocking women take the stage and open a conference. Like, you just would not see that. And um, one other thing I do want to say while well, I've got the microphone. Um, we've been speaking about STEM. I'm going to put the A in there, right, for arts. Not STEAM, which people talk about as STEM or a STEAM edu education. I want to flip that and own the word teams. Technology, engineering, arts, maths and sciences. You need us, we need you. Thank you. <laughs> My name's Tom Field. Um, for the last six years, we've been building a program that its ultimate outcome is to create companies. What we've learned in those six years is that the most important thing you do as an entrepreneurial development program is you build human beings first, companies second. Our core mission is to allow the people who affiliate with us to courageously pursue their passion and their purpose. Um, and that's a really important step. And it ties right to these skill sets that Megan was talking about because the World Economic Forum, if you look at their top 10 skill lists to be, and I like that, robot proof, um, it's not quite the days of old. It's a new game and a new world. And so we work with young people um, and we start with freshmen and from day one we start treating them like brands uh, with high capability, with the ability to find solutions and problems and customers. And the one thing I would say is that well, the other thing we've learned is that we are less solutions driven today than ever. What we are driven most by is finding the right problem and then falling in love with the right customers. Because if you fall in love with the right customers, working on the right problem, the solution will take care of itself um, because of that commitment. Great. So I'm going to start off with a question. So when, when we talk about entrepreneurship, often we talk about the competition, right? Doing something better than the competition, doing something different than the competition, or doing something brand new that, that might not even have competitors at the moment. But I want to sort of turn a little bit around that, and, and I, want, I want to invite each of you to talk a little bit about the role of collaboration and cooperation in the process of being an entrepreneur, in the process of starting a business. So I think that's a sort of a critical element that often gets missed with the headline conversations that occur around entrepreneurship. So whoever would like to weigh in first. 
Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so <clears throat> it was just um, in Harvard um, Business Review, there's a, a really interesting little study that came out through their blog uh, approach um, that said, okay, so how do, you, how do you actually crank innovation up in, in private companies? How do you actually grow innovative behavior? And the first thing they said was, is you've got to have a lot of people engaged. You don't want it to be siloed up by discipline, so the more the merrier. Volume matters. The, it's not only more people, but more ideas. And then creating this sort of ecosystem that says that's what we do here is we get a lot of things on the table. Um, and I think that's, that's the reality. Hollywood's done this sort of weird thing with entrepreneurs and innovators and tried to create these sort of white knight you know, it's sort of the new age John Waynes, right? They ride out, you know, they ride off into the sunset all by themselves, right? sort of the Steve Jobs thing. And it's just not real, right? I mean, I, I know almost no really sustainable companies that were built by individuals. All great things happen through teams and, and teams. I did a good job picking right up on it, didn't I? You did. And since you brought up competition, real quickly, just because you're, I noticed you are no longer from Nebraska, you're in Ohio. I want to be clear about what happened. Um, so many of us are unhappy about our outcome playing you in football, but here's the reality. Um, I heard this through um, one of my friends. Um, your uh, offensive uh, center um, looked over at our, our, our nose tag. He says, you look really worried today. Afraid to play the Buckeyes? He goes, not really. He says, I've got a, uh, an exam on money and differential equation theory, and I'm really not ready. And I, this is kind of weeding into my time. And the Buckeye looks over, he goes, man, I know. Wait till you get to fractions. <laughs> I understood that whole joke. Sorry. That's all right. That's okay. Who else would like to talk a little bit? Uh... I'll go ahead and, and chat a bit about that. Um, moving to Nebraska City, I knew not one person at all. Um, dove into this uh, business as a, someone who had traveled and had experience traveling and loved um, hospitality, as you've heard. But I knew no one. And I also knew that I couldn't do what I needed to do by myself. So one of the first things I did before even moving and, and purchasing my business is I looked up any associations or affiliations that I could find. And there is a Professional Association of Innkeepers International, just in case any of you are interested. But um, that was a wealth of information. Um, and then I found the Nebraska Association of Bed and Breakfasts. And I will tell you that we look at ourselves as a, we're a membership of about 35 right now. And we're collaborators. You might think of, we think of one another as competition, but we're not. We support one another and have an annual conference and all have the same issues. Um, I'm a great partner with our local Lead Lodge and Conference Center. Many of you probably know them. Um, we're in the same industry. We, we have the same community that we're, that we're catering to as far as tourists and so forth. So it was really important for me to go out and into our community. I have packages with other folks in the community to enhance my guest experience. And knowing that I didn't have a golf course in my backyard, but there's three in the community, I went out and now I have a golf package with one of the, the courses in town. Um, I get truffles from one of the bakeries downtown that I include in my packages. Um, I'm a, a big uh, fan of music and art, and so collaborate. We have an artist residency in town, the Kimmel Harding Nelson Residency for the Arts, and so I do a lot of collaboration with them. And it enhances not only our guest experience, but I think you're also you know, finding partnerships, and, and two is better than one. I mean, when you can go at it from a marketing standpoint, or you know, you're trying to have something that is going to encourage guests to come and, and have some neat experiences. So. Before I uh, jump to somebody else, I wanted to just do a follow-up question. So when you think about partnerships, right, what are you looking for? What are you looking for in a partner? Right? Whether it might be somebody in the future that you want to bring into the business or somebody who's external to your business. What, what are the, walk us through a little bit of the thought process or what are the characteristics you're looking for 
when I, right. you know, what they, great question. I mean, when I look out there for someone, I think the partnership needs to be beneficial to both parties. I, I do. I think there needs to be an, an advantage there, and you're gonna you're gonna gain that when you have um, different clientele. Then you're gonna make that. Um, it's going to grow, it's going to be bigger audience of the people that are interested in what you're doing. I partnered with a, a local potter and we did holiday and sp uh, spring teas for years and so she had her clientele, I had my clientele, I made the food in my studio in the kitchen and she made her pottery and then we came together twice a year and we had you know, great success because we had more, multiple people than as an audience that were interested. And then we also cross-marketed then. So then people that were her clients learned about my bed and breakfast, and people that were my bed and breakfast guests learned about her pottery. So that, that's, that's you know, what I think is important. Good, good. Megan, did you want to jump yeah, in on the collaboration? I, mean, I think the important thing about collaboration and competition is that what you're doing is creating a positive and productive ecosystem. And that's what collaboration does. Um, two things on that. Uh, I lived in China for a long time, I took my business to China, and in China, the, the way that you open a meeting or the first thing that your party across the table will say to you is, their first question is, how can we cooperate? And then the way that you close the meeting is you say, I look forward to ongoing collaboration. And that's just how China works. And the West has finally picked up on that. And so I think the West suddenly realises that we need to have a collaborative and cooperative relationship with China because that will mean that it's sustainable, whereas it used to be a very transactional, extractive relationship. And um, I just wanted to uh, also, I guess, to uh, give an example of my own. When I moved to Lincoln nine months ago, about six months ago, my husband and I started the Nebraska Artificial Intelligence and Data Sciences Meetup, because remember, it's the Johnny Carson Center of Emerging Media and Media Arts. And so we now have 250 members from across Lincoln in an artificial intelligence meetup, right? <laughs> Who'd have thought? Google, on Monday night, threw five execs to Lincoln, Nebraska to talk to us from Google, Google um, Cloud System. So again, we're not in competition with each other. There are startups there looking for talent. They're not in competition. We're cooperating to build a virtuous ecosystem. Todd? You want to jump in? Uh, sure. So uh, a few years ago, Brian Ardinger and I, I'm sure some of you people know Brian, we started a program called The Big Plate. And the intent of it was just to bring startups and creatives together. And we had, I don't know, 300 formal members. But we started things like Open Coffee, which some of you may have been to. And the intent was just to have people come together, share ideas, and then um, ideally help one another uh, build whatever project they had. And what we found over time is that these things just sort of gave life to themselves. And um, it was nice to see p people helping one another. And even though maybe they weren't in competition, they were still willing to help out with marketing or whatever deficiency they might have had. And then also, um, we've looked for ways to participate and help out. Maybe we're mentoring. I've tried to help Tom with some of his startup weekends and things like that. So. Um, yeah, it's just nice to kind of help one another and support the ecosystem where you can. I find the people who are best in their field, who are at the top of their game, are the most generous. And I think that's also how they got there. Because if you look at my advisory council, check it out, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> it is awesome. Um, they're the best in the business, and, but they, they're there because they want to give that give back. They, they're there because they see how interdisciplinary UNL is and that they could be on the ground level to create something totally new. So I'm going to start walking around. If there's, a, if there's someone over in this section who'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone over. Somebody's got to have a question. Ah, here's one over here. Hi, my name is Zoe. I'm an AmeriCorps member this year through the Nebraska Conservation Education Fund. Um, thank you all for your comments and for what you're doing. Um, my question relates to uh, innovation in rural areas. We talk a lot about meetups in Lincoln or um, businesses that are focused in Lincoln or in Omaha. And as someone who lives in a rural area <laughs> um, and is interested in going to some of these meetups and benefiting from these businesses as well as understanding that there are others in my community that would be interested specifically in agribusiness entrepreneurship programs, 
what are you or do you know of others that are bringing innovation to rural areas in Nebraska? Thank you. Great question. I'll jump on that first and, <clears throat> and let you know that, number one, <clears throat> rural people don't have to take second seat in this process. Right? Um, innovation comes from lots of places and I drive through rural communities a lot and, and it's amazing all of a sudden out of nowhere here's a um, <clears throat> manufacturing hub or a um, even an artistic or artisan approach to things that you don't expect all of a sudden it's just there, right? So we know that innovation and entrepreneurship is not it's not owned by the urban space. It's perhaps made easier there. Um, so we have a vision. Um, we have not vetted this very well yet, so I'm just gonna go ahead and we're amongst friends, I hope, so we'll throw it out. We think there's a real opportunity to create um, essentially a, um, a momentum program that would be um, at invitation only by communities <clears throat> because you cannot impose entrepreneurship on anyone. Um, it, is a, it is a creative act. It is an act of generosity and, and, and creativity and humanity and community. So only the willing uh, ever go to entrepreneurship because it's not easy, it's challenging. But we have this notion that communities around the state believe that they have a future different than the one that they're being told by the experts. My friend Chuck there has been working on this in a really diligent and beautiful way. And we think there's an opportunity to put an entrepreneurial momentum team into place, built a little bit on the Teach for America Peace Corps model, take really bright young people, um, and what would be ideal would be to have a graduate of Megan's program and our program and some really smart kid from um, Stanford or UC Berkeley that would work together to come into communities and help that community build its ecosystem. And be there for 60 to 90 days. Um, never, ever, ever do it to the community or for the community, but totally with the community. And to then be backside supported uh, with a more robust enterprise center approach, uh, ongoing training, but literally to value people where they are. Um, and I think the other thing that's really important to know is, is that when you really study innovation in big institutions like this one, we import more innovation than we export. And so the connection to rural and urban entrepreneurs and to the private sector is absolutely critical. And that's why we're so excited about what Todd's doing with Blueprint, because it's gonna work and it's gonna create opportunities at all kinds of levels. And some of those will scale in ways I don't think we can even imagine. Great question. I think Todd should weigh in on this. Yeah, I was just going to ask Todd if you could offer some additional insight on this question. Sure. So is Andrew from McCook here by chance? Hopefully this is okay to say. Uh, if not, don't tell him. So <laughs> uh, very quickly, Blueprint, what it is, is if you have a skill in what we traditionally call the trades, but you don't have the business skeleton to help support it and turn it into a venture, we give you that half of the equation. And our original vision is that we would build it within our facility and then launch it in three years, you're out on your own. But we had uh, somebody from the development office of McCook come to us and say, well, is there any reason, because we have a building that we're putting up, sort of a maker space and some other entrepreneurial efforts, is there any reason that we couldn't have Blueprint be part of this? And I said, no. Why not? I don't know what it'll look like. You don't know what it'll look like, but let's start the conversation. And so Andrew's coming in next week for the second visit with somebody from one of the community colleges there, and we're gonna try and see if we can't frame it out. So yes, small towns can come to us. If we can help, we're happy to. Got another question back here. I'm Ben Steffen. I'm from Humboldt, Nebraska. I'm an ag producer. I am wondering if any of you have seen in other places or can imagine some changes to public policy that could help us uh, spur that kind of entrepreneurship or innovation out in rural communities?
thoughts? So that's a big question. Uh, it's a great question. Um, so a lot of times, hopefully this helps answer that, you will hear that we don't have the funding they have out on the coasts. And I would argue that's BS, and here's why. If you have a great idea, I can probably find you $10 million by the end of the day. So I would argue that you just need to come up with good ideas. So um, while it's great to just say, hey, government agency, please give us money, and then we'll figure out what to do, I would figure out what is it that you want to do, what does that look like, and I think if you come up with a good program, I think that the funding is available. I think there's more money out there than we realize. It's tight, right? But I think that we can get it. Um, they also say that, you know, most learning takes place in the firm, right? So I didn't make that up. Thomas Friedman said that. Um, and he knows a lot more than I do. And another study that MIT did a few years ago was that we were outsourcing our innovation processes because innovation happens on the factory floor. And I would argue that innovation happens on the farm or the ranch. In my country, we don't differentiate. That's <laughs> just one thing, right? And in New Zealand, we talk about it in terms of um, the number eight wire. Like, you know, a farmer can fix anything with a piece of number eight wire, you know, like anything. And I think that ability in the way that people, rural people think, because you are solving so many problems all the time when you're on your farm or on your ranch, is that innovation can take place there. So what perhaps our role is as UNL or as educators or as people who offer online courses or whatever, it's about assisting with the scaffold of the framework about how you could ideate and prototype that innovative idea and take it to market. And I think that can happen virtually. I mean, we have internet connections. One of our emphasis of, of our program is about virtual production because we want students to be able to stay in Lincoln and build businesses. They might be, you know, their clients might be on the coast or in China or in, or in India, but they're based here. And I think, you know, we, if, you, um, if you go to Lincoln to Haymarket, to the Fuse co-working space, you'll meet a bunch of people who are working remo remotely from elsewhere in the country. They just happen to be there because there's a community and there's a really fast internet connection. And if I can just add one comment, I didn't want my response to the gentleman out there to be curt or cold. You know, there are ways to help um, get the answers toward what something might look like in your community. And I'd be happy to talk offline with some of the resources that you might pursue that could help um, shape that. If I just weigh in just briefly, I mean, in, in, the, in the policy arena, the challenge for entrepreneurs is, is you're trying to, to, to work through a business process, an ideation process, at the same time, you're trying to understand local, county, regional, state, and federal regulation. And I keep asking somebody, can somebody do a workshop for our program on how to navigate the regulatory environment? And I haven't found anybody yet who really feels competent pulling that off. That tells me there's a huge problem, right? And so I think from a regulatory perspective, we've got to take a really hard look at the burdens. Um, identify them and then literally, as opposed to phase them out, walk away from some of the regulatory approaches we take. Um, because innovation and small business can be killed with aggravation. And, and, and what happens in, in the world of regulation, and, and I own a business in Colorado and several other little ventures that I mess with, and here's what, what the deal is with regulation. It's not any one regulation. It's the series of them, and it becomes the burden of accumulated aggravation. And eventually, you're too aggravated to innovate, right? And so I think there's a value in, in, in policymakers sort of stepping back and, and asking the question, is what we're about to do, does it actually spur innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship, or does it inadvertently get in the way? And, and that's a challenge, and I think we need a more robust discussion in policy and business in the, in the country than we have, state, county, and local levels. Um, you know, the, because we can get in our own way if we're not careful. So my, my notion is, is, is we, need a, we need government to also embrace entrepreneurship and innovation at the same time we're asking leaders and the next generation to do the same thing. Any other questions out here? Somebody would like to ask something? Rick, right Yes, here. okay, good. I was gonna say somebody close to me, hopefully. 
Thank you. I'm Chuck Schroeder, uh, director of the Rural Futures Institute at the university. For Tom and Megan, you, you're flying under the flags of emerging media arts and agribusiness entrepreneurship. I know enough about both of you and what you're doing that, Tom, you started out with we build people first, then companies. I think people hear that and say, well, that's, gee, that's a nice motto. Um, talk a little bit about the human skills and the humanity coaching that you go through with students en route to their grasping their ideas for innovation. Megan, likewise, I know that you have a sense of attracting not just kids that are from Omaha en route to LA, but uh, uh, some objectives around rural kids and using these technologies for things that aren't just building new apps for their phone and gaming. Okay, uh, yeah, well, firstly, I'm a girl from the bush, the real deal from the outback in Australia, so I do have a feeling, a sense of community with you all. Um, I've lived in towns as tiny as, you know, 1,200. Um, so the Emerging Media Arts program that we're doing, uh, to, to, between all of us, entertainment doesn't thrill me. You know, it's actually not why I, that's not even why I was attracted to this role. I was attracted to this role because of the interdisciplinarity of it. So just yesterday I sent off to um, my dean seven ideas for research that we could become engaged with. And one is with, um, now I forgot the name of it, Clearpoint? It's a, it's a company in Lincoln that deals with addiction and our very disadvantaged people, post-traumatic stress disorder, just dreadful afflictions and they're generally very, very poor people. And so we want to work with them to, to research how we could use virtual reality to treat post-traumatic stress disorder and to treat addiction. And so that would be a research opportunity with us, the medical centre, the sociologists and this local business and something that could be spread out across the state. Um, so those are the kinds of research opportunities that we're very interested in. We're also interested in um, one of the things that um, is a bedrock of this program that we're putting together is what I call speculative futures. Has everyone seen Blade Runner? Or the, anyone seen the latest Blade Runner 2049? Anyone seen... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Star, well, uh, science fiction, you know the thing, right? It's in the future, Minority Report or whatever. Um, what we see on our screens tends to be what happens in our streets. So if our futures that we're designing and talking about and thinking about are dystopic or misogynistic or only white or feature smoking or guns, that's probably the kind of future that we're going to expect in 20 or 50 years time. And so through a process of world building, what we'd really like to do is to work with rural communities or to have any community be engaged in designing the kind of future they want. Because if you can't see a positive future for your community, there's not going to be one. That's how we as human beings operate. What, it's one of the things that separates us from the robots, actually. But, um, so I think that's a really important part of our program, too, is to, work, is to, des is to design our future. You know, what, bring that into being, put that on our screens. And I was in New York just, uh, I don't know, since I got here, month, two months ago, and I met this guy, Colin Brown, who's um, like a really big guy in entertainment, and he teaches entertainment producing at Columbia and whatever else. And he's from the UK, I'm from Australia, and in those countries, you get money to be able to create Australian soap operas or Australian movies, like in Canada, right? Because they believe it's really important that you see your own culture on screen. And I can remember Ashton Kutcher uh, in a podcast interview, he's from Iowa, he created that show, The Ranch, because the Midwest is not on our screens. Right? It's the stories of the coast. So I think it's really important that we get our stories onto our screens, be they virtual reality screens, be they computer games, be they television or whatever. But we need to see ourselves reflect, we need to see our own cultures reflected back at us. For, and, you know, that's just something I bang on about a lot. Yeah, so um, you know, how, do you build, how do you build an entrepreneur? Um, and can you teach entrepreneurship from the very beginning? And we think we can teach the skills of entrepreneurship. We cannot make any person into an entrepreneur because that is a, there's a mindset and a choice that's made um, to pursue that. 
So at the very beginning of the, when we first started this work six years ago, we really tried to build companies really quickly. And what we found was that they had a hard time sustaining because we were so focused on solutions, we hadn't worked on what it takes to sustain a business beyond the sort of excitement stage. And as I you know, have looked at Megan's curriculum and, and, and the, the sort of the tenets of it, we've, we haven't been, we're, we're more of a throw spaghetti at the wall group, um, but we've been throwing spaghetti at the wall in the same way that she has in many ways. And so we know first and foremost, every entrepreneur has got to be able to tell a story. And they have to be able to effectively tell that story and connect to people on a variety of levels. And to be able to keep telling that story and to frame stories through time. Because if you can't do that, you can't sell a new concept, a new idea, or even a revolutionary or transformative idea. The second thing is you've got to develop a really strong sense of what you, what you have as a brand, as a person, as, a, as an individual, and to know what you don't have, and then to be okay with what you don't have, and hire and partner to find those skills and traits, right? Just like, if I can use an institutional analogy, the University of Nebraska has zero value without the people of Nebraska. We are a zero value without the citizenry. Conversely, the citizenry is poorer without an institution, a series of institutions like we're blessed to have in the state, right? So you've, you've, it's that, right, that, that mashup thing. And then the third thing is, is to treat 18-year-olds, and that's because mostly our, we start with you know, freshmen, but 18 to 22-year-olds, treat them like they're smart, treat them like they're capable, invest them as human beings, flatten the structure, kill bureaucracy at every chance, absolutely refuse to teach to the test. We have no exams in our program. I hate exams. Do no value for us. I understand why they work in biochemistry. They don't work for us. And we try to drive people out of their paradigms. And I'm an ag guy. And I grew up with commodity, more acres, more yield. That equals success. We're trying to kill that out of them. And the other thing we have to work against, Chuck, all the time, is this thing in the Midwest that we don't like to talk about failure. We celebrate them because failures are how we learn really, really fast. And so we try to help students understand that messing it up is okay so long as you do it cheap, early, and learn like crazy, right? Um, so we're learn fast, you know, learn cheap, and, and, and learn as a group. And that, that sort of collaborative thing is so critical. And long term, um, the value that we're trying to create is a very clear culture from day one that extends beyond the institution because the day they graduate, many of our students will not yet have started their companies, right? It, it, you know, for all kinds of reasons, financial and timing and all those things. But the worst fate for an entrepreneur is to be isolated. Um, and, and there's a dark side to entrepreneurship. There is a very serious mental health challenge for lots of entrepreneurs who get isolated. Our goal is to create a community and that community that extends long beyond graduation, that lives and thrives in Nebraska, that creates a cadre, a cohort of people who will fight for each other, believe in each other, cheer for each other, challenge each other, get down to dirt, dig, fight, claw, right, right down to ruck and rugby, man. We're gonna get right down in that and we're gonna fight for it together. And if we can do that, then Paul's investment will have been worth the investment. We'll have created something special for the state. I'll just pipe in here real quick as one of those crazy entrepreneurs, right? Like I love mental it. health problem. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I just want to mention that, you know, I got into this because I had a passion. I had a passion for people, I had a passion for food, travel, and um, I love 80. 9% of what I do every day. I mean, there's always going to be that little bit, but, but you know, what I had when I bought the business was six rooms, five rooms, and then now I had six, then I went to five, and, and I have innovated over the years. So like Tom's saying, you know, you, you can't stay stagnant as an entrepreneur. You have to continue to 
look at what's out there and you need to, to, we talked about partnering, but you also need to find other of those crazy people or those other entrepreneurs to, to tag on to and say, okay, you know, I made it through the 2008, 9, 10, I was telling Todd that earlier and that, I, I survived, so if I did that, okay, now what's next? Well, I happened to decide to get to my restaurant license, so then that led to cooking classes and then that led to murder mystery dinners and that led to now I do kids cooking classes and now I do you know so so it's that continual innovation and I would say for all of you who are not in this space then support us that are in in different ways whether it's just listening to us or you know however it is that you could support us and I think that's really important for for those that are non entrepreneurs to understand that you know we can't we can't do this alone and, and we really, really do need others to, to hear our story and um, the policies and procedures, you know, regulations, they might hinder us a little bit, but, you know, if we can, if we can band together as a bed and breakfast association or whatever that association is or, you know, finding those other entrepreneurs and, and you know, an entrepreneur, if they have a passion, they're going to they're gonna succeed if, as much as they can to push through that. And, and make it happen. But we need the support of other entrepreneurs to do so. And we need women mentors for young women in entrepreneurship at a huge level. So if there are women in this room who want to be mentors for young women who want to start companies, we need your help. And Tom's been great. He's brought a group to my bed and breakfast to show them and, and hear my talk and show them that it's rural woman entrepreneur X tech you know, it came out of a whole different career, so it's possible. Hard to believe somebody would leave technology. <laughs> so uh, we're almost at the end of our, t our time. I want to ask uh, sort of one uh, somewhat open-ended question. It's, it's sort of uh, grounded in the, the sort of broad uh, headline of, you know, public-private partnership. So each of you have, have spoken in different ways about, about partnering, about, uh, about use, utilizing others, about community. Uh, we've had a question about policy, which brings sort of the, the, the governments in our space into this conversation. I'm wondering how you think about the partnership with an institution like the University of Nebraska. And it doesn't have to be specific to, to UNL, but uh, I'm curious because we're in this forum today, right? A couple of you are, are living inside this institution in a way. And I'm curious how you think about uh, an institution like this and what it can do differently or what it could do more of, what it could do better. And, and conversely, if somebody's out here or knows somebody who either has a small business or a small business idea, right, how might they approach the institution and say, hey, I need some help, right? So, uh, and they might not be a 22-year-old. They might be a 44-year-old, right, who's uh, been doing something for 10 years and goes, okay, I need a little help to kind of take this to the next level. Right, so I've painted a broad brushstroke of kind of the area I'd, I'd like you to speak to, but I'd like to hear at least from a couple of you kind of in that space, how can that bridge be built or strengthened or enlivened? Go ahead. So back when we had the big plate, we had, um, we had a lot of interest from outside groups who wanted to know what we were doing, you know, what were those crazy entrepreneurs doing over there. And we had banks coming in and different uh, community colleges and things. And I, I'll be blunt, it, we didn't always have the university knocking on the door. I think, and to be fair, they had a lot of things going on, right? They had their own party. And so uh, I will say that I don't know that if somebody is an individual and they're at home and they want to build something, I think it would be intimidating to approach the university. In defense of the university, I don't think the university can just stand around and wait for people to walk in the door. It's taxing and it's just not logistically possible. But maybe there is more of a public offering for a startup weekend. So if somebody comes in and there's, a, you know, I wanted, there's an entrepreneurship page, well, this is your chance. If you want to party with us, this is when you show up. Maybe it's twice a year. So. You know, something where there's, it's not so intimidating and there is an opportunity or at least a door to walk through. That's good. Any, any, anyone else? Well, there's going to be an awesome door on the zipper <laughs> on Q and, and 13th, I think. Um, I th I, in terms of uh, private 
in terms of partnering with the university, and I'm still a newbie, but I think there's lots of opportunities with um, the Rake School. With the, uh, most schools have a design studio in the final year where they actually want industry engagement. They want students to have experiential based learning. So you could, if you have a problem that you want to solve or if you have something you want to tackle, you could take it to the Rake School, you could take it to the computer science, you can bring it to the Johnny Carson Centre 2019 onwards um, and, and they, will, they will apply systems thinking, design thinking to try and solve that problem for you. They might write code. So there's, there's those kinds of open door opportunities. There's the YACT Club, which is an, a, a university a student run advertising agency, which is just totally amazing. Um, and in terms of also engaging, we're going to be having a program which will be every Friday actually, it'll be a public colloquium to which all of the public can come. I feel that it's very important that part of our mission is to increase the digital media literacy of Nebraska. And um, in terms of what the university could do better, um, would be, I'm not an academic by the way, it's probably quite clear, but um, is to be able to reward interdisciplinarity. I think the way that tenure's set up and the way that people are promoted, it might not be, it might not promote interdisciplinarity or uh, as much as it could. And I think if you've got really passionate young professors who really want to do crazy interesting things but they think it will count against them when it comes to tenure, then they're going to err on the side of caution. So I think we need to be much more open to that. Okay, good. Tom, I'll give real, you the last word here. Real quick on this. Um, old institutions develop habits. Land Grant University is an old institution. And we've developed a whole series of habits and structures. So we, and we have, we have these great things, right? I mean, the experiment station model is a brilliant model. And, Extension is a great concept, but, but what we have to do, and, and, and I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but I've made a career of it, so it's okay. Um, I think we have to reinvent the land-grant university. And I think we should treat it like we were starting from scratch. And the most important tenet of the new land-grant university is it absolutely values and seeks out and lives with local talent. I believe there are neighborhoods and communities of talented people who maybe don't have a whole bunch of letters behind their name, but they have experience and wisdom and vision that need to be embraced, right? Um, Jules Rogers is a student that we've worked with. She has this vision about how do we, how do we take neighborhoods that are being gentrified and give those neighborhoods back their own autonomy. And what we've done with Jules is to say, that's a brilliant idea. And so all we've done is connect her to person after person after person we know out in the world who can help her actually do that. So I think we have to value local knowledge. And then I think as a university, we have to change our structure and we must turn our vision outward and remake our processes so that we are truly collaborative and that there is no moat and no walls, just people. Because at the end of the day, the university is only a pod of town. We could get rid of the buildings and the labs and all the equipment, and if the pod of talent were committed to the state, the university would still live. I'm guessing you're going to be having some conversations with Mike after this. <laughs> Thank you all for being up here and contributing your time and your thought and your energy. Why don't we thank them? Thank you very much. Everybody.